Good morning. Uh, what, what I'm going, trying to do here is to remove some illusions and bring us back to realism. And when I say illusions, I refer to Father Bush's presidential campaign in the 80s, when the broad public was told, don't worry about global warming. Plants can solve all the problems. We will see a greening of planet Earth. We will be seeing deserts flourishing. And we will see a quadrupling of forest growth. And you know, that story is on the market still. There are still people out there that come and say, well, climate warming, that's one thing. But the biosphere is going to repair it. And all I'm going to do is to discourage you in such beliefs. Uh, it all started in Geneva uh, more than 200 years ago when it was discovered that plants eat air. You know, this was just a fundamental discovery because before people thought somehow plants take their food out of the soil. They still do take minerals, but the body of a plant is in large build of carbon. And these guys discovered with humble devices that plants take it from the atmosphere. But I just give you an image of how little there is to feed on. If you take all the carbon that is in CO2 in the atmosphere and you compress it to a thin layer of diamond, sloot, or graphite, you end up with 1.5 millimeters on the whole globe. So that little carbon is in carbon dioxide. And we add annually almost 10 gigatons of that carbon from fossil and biological resources to the atmosphere. And I'm just in this simple cartoon illustrating what the fraction of the biosphere is in that context. So that's the biosphere. We nibble from it every year, one to two gigatons into the atmosphere. These are soils which we also destruct by misuse, and most of the carbon comes from very deep sources. So we end up not what it might be, 10 gigatons, but fortunately, uh, only ha roughly half of that stays in the atmosphere. The most of the rest goes to the ocean. And for unknown, uh, an unknown or sink for the remaining is a job of biologists to find if it's in the biosphere. So just to make a story very brief and obvious, we have roughly 800 gigatons in the atmosphere, which is in, in very rough measures similar to what we have in the biosphere. It's a big salami. And if you take a slice from that salami from the biosphere, you put it in the atmosphere, it's roughly one to one. That's just to have an idea of what magnitude of carbon we talk about. Soils store three times as much carbon, but there's very little we can do except for destructing them. It's, uh, this, the carbon in those soils is thousands thousands of years old, as had been shown by, by 14C data. So there's very little that we can do about soils except destroying them. Now, there is an intimate linkage between CO2 and the biosphere. And for me, this is one of the most beautiful diagrams, and all of you have seen it before. But I, I still show it, because it shows so nicely that the atmosphere, if you go to the Mauna Loa, uh, oscillation, which is at the very end in this line here, is really coupled to the biosphere. There's this up and down of CO2 concentration as the northern hemisphere season warms up. And in the glacial periods, we had an average, now this is extended now to a million years, of roughly 240 ppm. And it was always high in the warm period, and it was always cold in the, in the cold, low in the cold period. And it was only 18,000 years ago that we had 180 ppm. And all the species, all the 270,000 plant species on this planet did so well at 180 ppm that they still exist today. So the biosphere needs only 180 ppm to do well. <laughs> 
And the doubling of that we have passed long ago. Now we are at 400 ppm. So I'm, I'm just making the point that the, the current level of CO2 is unprecedented in the recent evolution. So it's a unique event. So we are changing the diet of the planet. So that is something you should keep in mind if you talk to anybody about climate change. People say, when you say CO2, they say global warming. Well, that, as you have seen just by the previous speaker, global warming is an issue and it's evidenced. But first of all, CO2 is the food of the planet. And so we need to understand what's happening here and then we can also use the second pathway to understand how the climate system would feed back on, on biota. But first of all, it's food. Now that is the illusion that people have because it's food. More food should be good. And I will tell you today, more food is not good. Because if you eat more than is good for you, you know what happens. 50% of all carbon in the biosphere, 50% uh, of all biomass in the biosphere is, is carbon. So uh, there's a lot out there. And if you take a rough view at the biosphere, it's only forests that matter. It's 90% of all the carbon that is in the biosphere is in trees. In agriculture, it's 1.6% or less than so, 0.8. So if you double agriculture, it would be 1.6. So in terms of carbon storage, ag agriculture, grassland doesn't matter at all, even so it matters for our food. So it's really only forests we need to uh, talk about. Now, I'm, tr I'm using now a few slides to introduce you to a different view of the carbon cycle. I started by saying that plants eat air. And then I said, because plants take up CO2 through photosynthesis in their body, more could be better. That assumes that more photosynthesis means more growth. And I'm trying to convince you this is a wrong paradigm. It's in all school books. It's how I grew up, how you grew up at university. It's a wrong vision of the world. We have photosynthesis that is producing a raw material for growth, which is sugar. And that is feeding down in what I'm going to call now the sink for carbon. So parts of plants, parts of the biosphere that take up carbon. And obviously, that, these two green arrows they are driven by other questions. If there is light limitation, of course then photosynthesis is the only limiting process in deep shade. But if there are other limitations such as shortage of nutrients, water and temperature, then it's the upward error that is driving on demand how much sugar can be used for building a house. And to make this obvious, I'm actually trying to build a house with you. And I'm starting with house building. It's a very trivial example. You have a brick factory that is delivering brick on a building site that finally comes into a city. So who would believe in that room that the speed by which you build a home depends on how fast the brick factory delivers brick to the building site? We all know it's the masons, it's the amount of beer they have, the holidays, the strikes they have, it's all those things. Now why would we then assume that the production of sugar by a leaf is inevitably following, followed by growth? It's like an economy. It's the market that controls how much you can produce. It's that market that says we need carbon. And on demand, the factory delivers. But the control comes from the market. And the market is controlled by other things than carbon. And I'm trying to make this very short. I could give a long lecture about this. It's a new paradigm that I'm pushing. It's not actually new. People in agronomy knew that in the 80s already. But people don't read agronomy literature in ecology, and modelers don't either. So what I'm saying is that whenever resources that plants need to grow, like water, if there's drought, come into play. It's the market that responds first and not the producer of raw materials. 
So when drought comes in, plants stop growing. And because they stop growing, they don't need any fresh photosynthase. So they try to reduce the machinery, but they start piling up non-structural carbohydrates in the meanwhile. That's why under drought, we learned in school, stomates, closed plants, suffer from CO2 limitation, and therefore they're hungry and they can't grow. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Drought affects first the machinery of building new structures, then there is no demand for carbon, so reserves are piling up. You find starch and lipids going up, not just sugar. So growth controls photosynthesis under drought. It's the same with low temperature. Whenever it gets cold, photosynthesis is the last process to go down. It's the formation of new cells, of new houses, if you like, that first gets back, and then the demand goes down, and then there's less building. And it's the same with mineral nutrients. In the old way, we thought if there's a lot of carbon, plants will take the nutrients, which are there anyways. No, they're not waiting for humans to release CO2 to have a little bank account of manganese, molybdenum, potassium, phosphate in the ground. Oh, now it's more, more, more carbon, now we can take that. You know why that is not going to work? Because there's a bad neighbor. If you put, if you put nutrients aside, your neighbor takes them. So there was always competition for free nutrients. And nutrients are really the absolute limiting resource for the productivity of the planet. It's not nitrogen. Carbon and nitrogen are infinite, theoretically infinite resources. You just take both from the atmosphere. But it's phosphorus, it's magnesium, it's potassium, it's manganese, it's molybdenum, it's iron, it's sulfur. It's just 25 chemical elements that we need. We need plants needs, animals needs, from bacteria to elephants. The world is controlled by stoichiometric rules. This is the element ratio in organisms to remain healthy. If we don't selenium, if we don't have selenium, we are ill. If anybody in this room has no selenium, a person wouldn't sit here. So we need those resources, and they're not falling from sky. And it's an illusion to believe if you have more photosynthesis, all these other items will just come and just wait for being built into the mass of body. So the carbon cycle is controlled by the nutrient cycle. And so if you want to model the carbon cycle, you need to model the nutrient cycle. You cannot model the nutrient cycle and then believe the carbon cycle will just follow. Now experiments have shown that photosynthesis can be stimulated by adding CO2 under conditions when none of these nutrients are limiting. We produce tomatoes and cucumber in greenhouses, but that means you study a system that is decoupled from the nutrient cycle. If you, however, couple a system to the nutrient cycle, it's the nutrient cycle that controls how much carbon can be built in. So Father Bush was wrong. He had no idea of the nutrient cycle or his advisors. Now, let me, ish let me address another issue. That is a very difficult one, and I had no problems convincing economists at MIT and engineers, they always understand. And I've always problems with ecologists and biologists to understand the very simple difference between cash flow and capital. The carbon cycle is the cash flow, carbon storage is the capital. And people mix the two. I don't understand that. If you do this privately, you are bankrupt immediately. But you can go to science and nature paper, and you find people who tell you that faster growth means carbon sequestration. That is as if, if the turnover, cash turnover, would be the capital of a company. Nobody would do that. But we see that published in the most prominent journals. Just to make my point, I have this little cartoon here. You feed in what we call net primary production into a system, sort of sugar production, and then the system feeds out some things like litter production, recycling, mortality. And the level of the filling of that carbon pool is not controlled by these two, except if they are different. So if they are the same, if the input equals the output, the level could be anywhere here. It's only for a time being, if there's more going in and less going out, you can build up a pool. But as soon as you start harvesting that pool, you go down. So we should not com 
confuse what people call net primary production and what people call net ecosystem production. These are two completely different worlds. And in fact, this one is usually negatively correlated with the storage term. So if a system is highly productive, usually its storage is less. Just think of a poplar uh, plantation. You have an extremely high yield, but if you take all the carbon per unit land area, it's actually low compared to an old growth forest. It had been shown for Amazonia that the part of the Amazonian basis that shows the highest productivity stores less carbon than the part of Amazonia that has a slightly lower productivity and it stores more carbon. So never use net primary production, biomass production, or in simple terms, growth as a measure of storage. If you got that message, I was successful. Now, ma make a simple mental experiment to make this more clear. We just allow any ecosystem, any forest, any tree to grow for only 100 years and then it's either dead or harvested. So we have a life cycle that goes over 100 years to 100% biomass, whatever that is. And we allow that system to grow and then it's harvested. And the mean over the whole lifespan of that tree or of that forest parcel, the mean lifespan carbon pool would be 50. Now we decide we have the system growing twice as fast. So the system goes twice in a 100-year cycle through that growth. So it reaches the same height. So productivity had been doubled. What is the pool size? On average, it's exactly the same. Now we push the system further. We are quadrupling the productivity by harvesting four times a year because we don't want to wait for economic reasons for the system to saturate. What is the pool? It is less. So never confuse growth of trees, growth of a forest, net primary production with carbon storage or carbon sequestration. I mean, all trees grow until trees die. We do not need science to prove this. That is why we have foresters. So if anybody shows me a 70-year-old forest, this forest is sequestering carbon, I said, yes, that's why we have foresters. Every year, there's growth. But somewhere else, a tree dies. So a growing tree does not sequester carbon unless mortality or harvest of another tree is prevented. You can guess how long you can do that. So let me show you just very briefly two experimental results of our own work. I was always uh, disappointed by people using very artificial systems with high nutrient provision, with disturbed soils, with young trees isolated from each other, and providing those systems with extra carbon dioxide to test whether plants eat air. Obviously, they eat more CO2. If you provide other provision, then they grow faster. But that's not the real test. We need actually trees that have been grown for years in a tight up nutrient cycle, and we need big trees to test this assertion that CO2 can be a fertilizer or not. So what we did with the help of the Swiss Science Foundation, we enriched 40 meter big trees uh, with carbon dioxide, with a crane, with a high-tech uh, instrumentation. So we used not a young plantation of just one species, but we had diverse forests. After eight years, there was absolutely no evidence that trees grew faster, neither at the beginning nor at the end. And we repeated that experiment. This is for different species here. Who wants to read more? Journal Ecology, Bader et al., 2013. We repeated that experiment on spruce, which is the, the, the most important commercial timber in Europe. And we did this with 40 meter tall trees, and we collected uh, tree cores last October from a different height in the canopy. And as you can see, at the end, there is absolutely no uh, growth over those treatment years uh, uh, that would allow us to conclude that CO2 produces any benefit for those big trees. There's other works in the Northern Boreal Forest by Sonne Linders Group in, in Umeå that showed exactly the same, but they had 
added fertilizer to part of the experiments, and then they saw a CO2 fertilizer experiment. But if you don't add fertilizer, then the, the nutrient cycle controls the carbon cycle, and you should not see any faster growth. But even, even if you saw faster growth, you should not fall in the trap believing this is carbon sequestration, as I pointed out before. So even if there were CO2 fertilization of growth, that does not at all mean that there's more carbon storage. It only means the wheel is turning faster and you are approaching mortality faster. There may be a phase of ramping up, and we may still be in that phase when forests took advantage of early CO2 enrichment and the nutrient cycle was still allowing for some ramping up at a steeper slope, but eventually there's only one life and all this carbon will come into a cycling situation sooner or later. So the conclusion from CO2 experiments and CO2 effects on plants is I believe carbon sinks control carbon sources. The nutrient cycle, water shortage all affect uh, the building sites and photosynthesis is not a limiting process, it's a process, it's a slave to the master, and the master is the growth process, and it operates on demand, which makes a lot of sense. Forest productivity is currently, in my understanding, not carbon limiting, limited, and carbon sequestration in forests requires longer residence time. That means later mortality. How would you ever experimentally test whether trees decide to die after 180 instead of 160 years? That the mean residence time is the central term to define storage. So for modeling this means we need to depart from the old paradigm where we started modeling the sugar production of photosynthesis and then eventually we traded this into productivity and growth and storage. We need to reverse this. I believe this old model was dressing the horse from the tail. We need to start dressing the horse from the head. And the head is the nutrient cycle. And other drivers like water and temperature control the amount of carbon that can be taken up. That's a fundamental change of paradigm. I uh, made a little review here in Current Opinions in Plant Biology where I summarized these views. Okay. So what can we do in the green world? We biologists are often asked by experts, can you offer some solution? I mean, trees store a lot of carbon, we can produce biofuels. Let me spend a few words on these options. I'd like to say we biologists are most often misused in that debate. And we should have a very realistic picture of what can be done, what is realistic, and what is not. So what can we do? I mean, it's obvious. We can reduce carbon release. Andreas Fischlin has nicely illustrated that this is really the option, reduce emission. Okay. Second, if we cannot do the first or if we are too slow in doing the first, we need to capture it. What well, are people that live with the belief you can do this technically? To me, this is absurd. First of all, most of the C2 is emitted from diffuse emitters. A small fraction of CO2 is actually emitted from point sources. And to do any technical solution, you need point sources. And these point sources need to be in areas where the geology permits you, hopefully, to store some CO2 underground. Now, if you go from these po few point sources where this is possible, and including some pipelines across the continent, which cost a lot, there may be a small fraction of carbon that is emitted from huge coal emit, uh, CO2 emitting power plants, but it's a small fraction. It's not going to do anything for the billions of cars that move on the planet, on the homes that use CO2 uh, uh, emitting fossil fuel production. So I'm not going to talk about this. I just leave you with my concern that there is much hope. There's a lot of illusion on the market and money making, money making in the first. <coughs> so biologically, from what I told you, the logic thing would be to build forests. I will talk very briefly about this, or to substitute forest fuels by renewable biological resources. <clears throat> I will talk about this also very briefly. I call them pretentious claims to mitigate the carbon storage, because if you follow the Kyoto Protocol, where people 
are receiving incentive for reforesting forests that had been cut after 1990. You just need to be aware that a tropical, largely tropical forest takes up to 200 years to rebuild the original pool. So we remain in a depth for 100 to 200 years. And even if those young trees grow now, it's just reducing the depths, but it's not solving the problem. It's solving it perhaps in 200 years. So the logic thing would be not to cut it in the first place. Second, enhanced carbon stocking in forests. This means more carbon per unit area is limited. I mean, a forest grows, the trees don't grow to sky, so you can. And Switzerland and Luxembourg are record holders in Europe for per unit land area carbon stocking. But that's not that the Swiss and the Luxembourgians are particularly greenish. The only reason is that the salaries for foresters are too high, so they get their timber from Siberia. Uh, and of course, you cannot do this very long. And if you do it, you rise the risk of wind throw. Windsor is something great for biologists, so nature can live with Windsor. But in a single night, we have lost three annual harvest timber during the storm Lothar in Switzerland. So as older these trees get, the more likely they are felled in a case of an extreme event. Not a disaster ecologically, but in, if you want to store carbon, well, that's not what you like. So finally, you can try to expand the forest area. Well, where would you expand it? on agricultural land and feed and competing with the food industry. We, we, have, we see this happening in a temperate zone because uh, agricultural marginal land is increasingly um, overgrown by forests. So then let's go to fossil, fuel, uh, to fossil fuel substitution from biofuels. I will make this very brief. And I just refer to one example that had been nicely being calculated through for rapeseed. To produce one liter of rapeseed, you need, in the end, if you do a full cycle calculation, one liter of fossil fuel. Great. Let, let us do a, a mental experiment. We don't allow German and Swiss foresters. We allow them to harvest, to do their annual harvest, and then we prevent that this timber is going anywhere else than in heating or burning in cars and houses. We are not pr printing any newspapers. We are not building any fences, any houses. We are just using it for substituting fossil fuel. And we, ex we, we ignore that the energy content of timber is much less than of fossil fuels. And it needs a lot of technology to drive with wood uh, or wood chips. Uh, we ignore that for the moment. Now, if you take the complete annual harvest to substitute carbon by carbon, so timber carbon by fossil carbon, anybody in this room can do it for Italy or for any country. Just take the statistical yearbook of your country. You know how much fossil fuels you imported or produced and emitted, obviously, and how much that annual timber harvest is. Convert this to carbon and compare it. So it's not science. Any, any citizen can do that. In Germany, you can replace 5% of the current emission. No newspapers, no houses, oh, and no efficiency considerations. If you then say, OK, timber isn't going to bring us further or much further than we already use it. I'm not against using timber. I should not be cited for being against using timber. I'm actually trying people to convince houses should be built of timber and not of cement and brick. But we just need to be aware what the magnitude is that we, we can solve. And if we then say 10% of our arable land is taken out from food production and we produce um, of, um, cro uh, fuel uh, energy crops, 10% of the market we take out. And we do this with the most intense agriculture. So we produce 20 tons of biomass per year. That means 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year. That's very intense agriculture. And if we do that, in Germany, we can again replace 5%, and in Switzerland, 2.3%. You can reach the same effect by driving with a car that uses 6.3 or 6.1 in Germany, instead of 6.6 .6 liters of gasoline per 100 kilometers. 
And if you go to the new, newest statistics of, of cars consumptions, you find half of the market, uh, marketed cars currently are running below six. And 20 years ago, they were running at eight liters. So these measures that don't just mean switching on your brain and not doing anything else in the traffic jam, it doesn't matter how many horsepower you have in your engine. Uh, I just wanted to make it quite clear. I'm not against biofuels, but you should be aware. It's just a drop of water on a hot stone. It's something we should do, perhaps, as long as it doesn't, we don't compete with the food industry. But I think energy crops should rather be forbidden. Because we are lying ourselves in our own sack. If you produce on a square meter of land biofuel, that food that could be produced there comes from somewhere else. And we don't have, as far as I know, an overflow of food production globally. We rather have one billion people not having enough to eat. I'm not talking about waste of food. But statistically, this is not a world that has an overabundance of food. So wherever you allocate land to fuel production, just for your happiness or for business as usual, or running with over, overpowered engines, these SUVs that we see everywhere, in cities where they make no sense at all. Yeah. And you think of the impact you create by using alcohol from those, for those cars, by allocating food production to Argentina and Brazil, where people cut the forest or mistreat the soils. <coughs> Biofuels are a no-go for me. They rise food prices. They commonly are not produced sustainably because nobody cares for pesticides and soil treatment. While in the food industry, we have a biological uh, idea in the population. People think we should care, but if it's biofuels, nobody cares. And there is, of course, if you fertilize, you produce N2O emission. Andreas Fischlin has shown that the rising contribution of laughing gas to the greenhouse effect. There's no way you can fertilize a crop without producing laughing gas. And laughing gas is 200 times more greenhouse efficient than CO2. So that's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to intensify agriculture. We actually need to extensify ag agriculture to use less fertilizer, produce less laughing gas. We need more area for agriculture, not for fossil fuel production. Prudential's claims in the context of green options to mitigate in the climate change are <coughs> Uh, a lot on the market. And we need to be aware that a net saving of fossil energy is very small if we apply green tools. Afforestation, I would say better don't clear cut in the first place and use plantations that can be managed sustainably. Fossil fuel groups are not efficient. They compete with the food industry and bioenergy. The effects are very small and at best we use waste uh, for producing some gas. So the future uh, is not in the green uh, mitigation world. Something, small things can be done, but it's not the big solution of the problem. Fully accounting for all costs and benefits, there's very little potential for substituting fossil fuel energy by bioenergy. Maybe 3 to 5% on top of the current uh, consumption, that might be a way to go. So, to close, I think the current biosphere is carbon saturated or very close to carbon saturated. I don't see any Father Bush type benefit of CO2 enrichment in the atmosphere for the biosphere. And there is no green solution to the CO2 problem. Also, there may be some local or possibilities, but globally, this is not, there's no green solution. And the industry, the oil industry, loves us scientists to talk about green solutions because this means uh, academic potential is tied up on an area that is never going to hurt them. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>